Well, as we enter the Thanksgiving week, I want to pose the following question to you this morning. How is worldly thankfulness different from biblical thankfulness? How is worldly thankfulness different from biblical thankfulness? What makes the experience and expression of thankfulness in the culture different from thankfulness defined and described in the Bible? I think there are a couple of fundamental differences. First, biblical thankfulness is not just polite words. It is a sincerely thankful spirit. It has a humble demeanor about it that permeates our attitudes. The world's thankfulness can be words just spoken, simply to be polite, but without a genuine spirit of thankfulness. A person can say the words, thank you, but internally they can have, at the same time, have a sense of entitlement to whatever it was they just received. Second, worldly thankfulness is tied most frequently to circumstances. It's most often tied to circumstances, such that a person feels thankful when circumstances are good and things are going their way. But biblical thankfulness is anchored to the character of God, meaning that Christ followers are learning to cultivate a spirit of genuine thankfulness even when circumstances are not good and when things are not going their way. Thankfulness becomes an outlook on life because our focus is shifted from our circumstances to the unchanging character of God. And as we learn to anchor our thankfulness in that immovable bedrock of God's character, then our thankful spirits are less vulnerable to the shifting sands of circumstance and temporary situations. And we find that we can be genuinely thankful even in the middle of terribly difficult circumstances. Matthew Henry was an 18th century Puritan preacher. His Bible commentary, known as the Matthew Henry Bible commentary, is still among the most popular commentaries of all time. Well, he was once robbed on the streets of London And anyone here who has had their car broken into or their home burglarized or a purse or wallet stolen, you know how unsettling an experience like that can be. It's unnerving. But as Matthew Henry sat down later to write about the robbery that he had experienced, a genuine spirit of thankfulness filled his heart, anchored to the unchanging character of God. And it led him to write these words. He said, Let me be thankful first because I have never been robbed before this. Second, I am thankful because although they took my wallet, they did not take my life. Third, I am thankful because though they took all I had, it really wasn't all that much. And fourth, I am thankful because it was I because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. I think those are just remarkable words, and I think they reflect the spirit of thankfulness, even in the midst of something difficult. And cultivating a thankful spirit like that is a discipline, friends. It takes time and practice. There is not a switch that you can flip and turn it on. Oh, how we wish it was that easy. How I wish it was that easy for me. But be encouraged this morning, be encouraged. Because as we practice and grow in our ability to choose a spirit of thankfulness in all circumstances, we can choose that. And as we do, even in the midst of trials and adversity, our attitudes and words will issue forth a radiance, a fragrance even of Christ-likeness. And it will please the Lord and it will be a blessing to the people around us. Now, this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 33 together. You know, the book of Psalms repeatedly calls us to sing and pray and worship and give thanks in all kinds of circumstances. But just to be clear, 
the psalmist never suggests that we should ignore or deny the circumstances that we're in the middle of. He never says ignore all of that and just put on a happy face. It's not what we're called to do. Rather, he calls us to face our circumstances and to recognize that they are temporary and then to place our focus on the unchanging nature of God because his character is permanent. And in this particular psalm, the author, the, the author who was believed to be King David, the author called the people to worship and then he gave three reasons why they should do so, each reason being anchored to the character of God. And so we're going to work our way through the psalm and see what the Lord would want to teach us together this morning. The psalm opens with a traditional call to worship, which is what we call a call to worship. And we find it in the first three verses of the chapter, which is what I read for you in the welcome this morning. So let's look at these verses. It says, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. The psalmist is inviting the entire worshiping community to gather for worship. He's calling them together, just as you and I have done together this morning. And once they're assembled, he gives a call for a lively and energetic outpouring of praise to the Lord. Sing joyfully, he says, and let your singing come from hearts that are bubbling over, bursting with joy. You know, God has brought his people into a covenant relationship with him. And, people are, and these people are described as righteous and upright in verse 1. For the psalmist, in the Old Testament era, a relationship with the Lord was often demonstrated or lived out through the sacrificial system. But for you and I, living on the New Testament side of the cross, we worship today because Jesus died on the cross so that we might be forgiven. And he rose from the grave three days later, and he broke the power of sin and death over us. And we stand before God now forgiven. We are declared righteous because of what Jesus has done. And it is indeed fitting for the righteous and the upright. Those of us who are in relationship with the Lord, it is right and fitting for us to give him praise. These opening verses urge us to give God our worship with joyful voices and with musical instruments and skillfully played music and volume. Do you see that? He says, give shouts of joy. There needs to be some volume in our worship. Yes, there are times when it's right to be quiet and still before the Lord. But the psalmist is saying to the gathered congregation, now is not that time, he says. So shout for joy. Verse 2 says, let your praise be filled with music. Bring out the harp and the ten-string lyre. These two instruments, poetically, they're representing the larger uh, full orchestration or instrumentation that would accompany the singing. Psalm 150 is a different example. And in in that psalm, uh, full instrumentation is described. It talks about brass and wind instruments and strings and percussion. So when when the psalms call us to play instruments or to play the harp, it's representative of this larger string or larger instrumentation that can accompany our music. And as you know, some people are gifted more like Dane Steyer, who can actually play a string and a wind and a percussion instrument all at the same time, which he did a little bit of that this morning. I am clearly not gifted that way myself, but some are. And verse 3 bids us to sing a new song to the Lord. You know, every generation in every culture receives for themselves God's revelation of himself in the scriptures. And they experience his grace and his power in ways that are unique to them. 
And so their singers and songwriters and their musicians should write new songs. Every generation should have new songs exalting the Lord with creative and new expressions of joy-filled praise. It should be spontaneous and fresh because new mercies from the Lord should stir up new songs in our hearts. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing to inherit songs from previous generations. It's a wonderful gift, a priceless treasure. But the music we already have is not enough. Our God is infinite, and he is at work in every generation. And so there are always new reasons and new occasions and new revelations of God that should spring forth new songs from our hearts. So music must be composed and new lyrics written, creating new expressions of praise for new voices to sing. And when the psalmist writes, play skillfully, he says, play skillfully, what he means right there is play with excellence. He's not saying you better play perfectly and not make any mistakes because perfection is not the standard. We strive for excellence. We bring our very best to the Lord because our God is worthy of the very best that we have to offer him. And while the psalmist applies that truth to musicians, it is equally true of every single one of us. In whatever way you and I serve, no matter where that is, wherever we serve the Lord, we are to do so with excellence. Not perfection, but bringing our very best to the Lord. And we bring it to the Lord with shouts of joy. See that at the end of verse three? Bring it with shouts of joy. That speaks about enthusiasm, bringing it with celebration and spontaneity and volume. Those are the words that should characterize our worship and even our fellowship. So I want to encourage you this morning as we begin with these three verses, I want to encourage you to think about preparing your hearts during the week for Sunday morning worship. Think about preparing your hearts during the week for Sunday morning worship. Ask God to fill your heart during each week so that you can come to church on Sunday with a heart that is bubbling over and bursting with joy. Remind yourself of this great salvation that you have received. It's a gift by a, a gift of grace through faith. You have been forgiven and cleansed and redeemed and adopted and gifted to serve. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. And someday he is coming back. Meditate on those blessings during the week so that your heart can be filled with worship and praise by the time you pull into the parking lot on Sunday morning. But also, also make note of God's activity in your life during the week. Answered prayers, surprises, his provision, his graciousness. So that when you come, our fellowship can be characterized by celebration and enthusiasm as we recount with one another the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord during the week. Because what God is like our God? There is no one like him. There's no one like him. And just imagine, just imagine how it would delight the heart of God if each of us, when we gathered on Sunday morning, will have come prepared with our hearts filled during the week, reminding ourselves of our salvation, reminding ourselves of how we've seen God's activity in our life. And we come together ready to worship and fellowship and give him the praise he so richly deserves. Now, after this initial call to worship, the psalmist gives us a reason for worship, a reason for worship. Some of you might remember as kids uh, being around either when you were uh, responsible to light the charcoal grill or maybe dad did and you watched him do it. But some of you can recall the lighting of a charcoal grill. And then sometimes you had to stand and wait for that fire to for, for the briquettes to kind of catch on fire and it would kind of slowly happen uh, as the flame moved from 
charcoal piece to charcoal piece. And to speed up the process, what did we do? Sometimes we would we'd blow on the flames, right? We'd try to blow just enough. We didn't want to blow hard enough to put the fire out. We wanted to blow just hard enough to spread the fire more quickly to the other briquettes. It's called fanning the flames. Well, in verses 4 to 19, the psalmist is going to fan the flames of worship in our hearts by blowing three reminders into our hearts about why God is so worthy of our worship. And the first reason he blows into our heart is that God's word is uncontested. God's word is uncontested. It always accomplishes his desired purpose. It always accomplishes his desired purpose. Look at verses four and five. It says, for the word of the Lord is true and right, or sorry, it's right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. The word of the Lord is rooted in and anchored to the character of God. God's word cannot be separated from God himself. His spirit is as close to his word as breath is to speech. What is true of God is true of God's word. And here the psalmist reminds us that God and his word are right and true and faithful. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his unfailing love. God's word is without error and completely true. God never speaks deceptively, mistakenly or ignorantly. God will never have to hold a press conference because some new research proved his statement wrong. He won't. God's word is truth itself, never in need of correction or updates. Always right, always true, and absolutely trustworthy. And God's words and his actions are consistent with his attributes. God never acts out of character. And therefore the psalmist declares he is faithful in all he does and the earth is full of his unfailing love. Because he is faithful in everything he does, he is worthy of our confidence. The confidence of all creation, really. This is part of what set the God of Israel, apart and made him different from the pagan gods and idols of the surrounding nations. You see, pagan gods were assumed to be unreliable, a little bit unpredictable, and often unprincipled. And so the idol worshiper never knew for sure what the idol would require or expect of him or her on any given day. But the psalmist reminds us, the God we worship is nothing like that. He's nothing like that. His word has been revealed and it's written down. And in our generation, different from the psalmist, the psalmist, they had portions of the scripture. In our generation, we have the entire word of God available to us. And it has been written down and it is right and true. And God never speaks or acts contrary to to it. He is faithful and just. And because of that, he deserves our praise. He is faithful to who he has told us that he is. And so he deserves our praise. In verses six through nine, the psalmist is going to continue and he's going to demonstrate the power of God's word, the power of it. And in this section, the psalmist begins to structure each verse, I'm going to give you a little bit of grammar here. He structures each verse as two parallel statements. And what I mean by that is the first half of the verse is parallel to the second half of the verse. And he does this intentionally because in Hebrew poetry, when a, when a psalmist does this, he's adding emphasis to his words. That's part of how they do that in poetry. In in our day today, we use bold print or we put something in italics. That's the way we add emphasis. But for psalmists and poets in that day, uh, using parallel statements was how they added 
emphasis. So look at verses six through nine with me now. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. You see the parallelism? He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Verse eight, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. See the parallelism in those four? In these verses, the psalmist uses images right out of Genesis 1. The psalmist has taken us all the way back to creation where nothing existed except God himself. And the psalmist wants us to linger here for a moment and reflect on the uncontested power of God's spoken word. When God decided to create, he spoke. And when he spoke into the darkness, the world sprang into existence in all of its beauty and its grandeur. It was formed by his word then, and it is sustained by his word today. God's word is powerful because it accomplished its purpose. All of creation reveals God's majesty and power and his transcendence. Verse 7 says, He gathers the, uh, the waters of the sea and keeps them in their place. He contains the deep waters, putting them into storehouses, just as a farmer puts his corn into bins. And his absolute control of the water, this description of his control over the water, was another poetic illustration, a striking illustration of God's power because he could control what seemed untamable, the waters. And friends, this should prompt us to praise and give thanksgiving to God. And this praise should not only come from us, his people, but verse 8 says, all of the earth should worship and fear the Lord. All of the earth should show honor and reverence. A creator this powerful deserves the worship of all of the people in the world. A God who created ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. A God who creates that way is worthy of our worship, worthy of our adoration. Verse 9 says, He simply spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The creation story is told with this phrase being repeated over and over. And God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. And that's repeated over and over again. That, friends, is uncontested power. God's word is powerful. In, in verses 4 through 9, the psalmist is reminding the Israelite congregation of his day and the Princeton congregation of our day that God is worthy of our worship because his word is powerful and uncontested. What God decrees happens. When God commands, it comes to be. His word faces no opposition and it never fails. It is powerful, sure, and certain, always accomplishing its desired results. And our hearts, our hearts can be reminded of that truth every single time we step outside and, to, and see the world around us. Our hearts can be stirred to worship if we'll remember our Creator. Now, the psalmist gives a second reason to worship our great God. And he does this in verses 10 and 11. And this one, in this reason is God's will is unstoppable. God's will is unstoppable. Just as God rules over the created order in verses six through nine, in verses 10 and 11, he rules over the affairs of men. Look at these verses with me. It says, the Lord, the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Notice the parallelism in those verses as well. 
Now, these two verses are a clear declaration of God's sovereignty, his absolute control over the nations of the world. He made this world and he governs it according to his purposes and his plan. And his will is unstoppable. The Old Testament book of Daniel reminds us the Most High is ruler over the kingdoms of men and he gives them to anyone he wishes, removing one king and setting up another, just as he desires. So God puts people into positions of leadership, and he grants them power to rule and authority to make decisions, but God remains sovereign, and he will overrule when necessary for the accomplishment of his will. The plans of the nation will accomplish nothing if they are in direct competition to the plans of the Lord. The word in verse 10, that our uh, NIV says it's foils. The word foils means to break or to cancel, to annul. If God needs to, he can and will pop the plans of a nation like a balloon. Only the plans of the Lord stand firm. And unlike the plans of men, which regularly have to be revised and updated and corrected, the purposes of God's heart stand firm through all generations. He needs no contingency plans, no backup plans, no plan B or C in case plan A fails. Because his plans do not fail. His will is unstoppable through all generations, no matter what people say, think, or do. The psalmist wants to stir in our hearts a desire to worship through this truth. The God of heaven is a great and glorious king, and every creature and every plan will bow in submission to him because his will is unstoppable. The third and final reason that the psalmist gives us to worship is found in verses 12 to 19. And it is this, God's watchful eye is unblinking. God's watchful eye is unblinking. Look at verse 12 with me. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. You know, of all of the nations of the earth, one nation stood out above all of the others because God had chosen that one nation. It was Israel, the people he chose for his inheritance. You know, when the psalmist wrote those words, he may have had Deuteronomy 7 in mind, because there's a couple of verses in Deuteronomy that say this. God was speaking through Moses to the Israelites, and he said, for you, the Israelites, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all of the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept his oath that he swore to your fathers. So I think the psalmist had may have had Deuteronomy 7 in mind. But in verses 13 through 15, the psalmist quickly moves his attention from Israel's favored status to the recognition that God watches over all people, not just some, not just one nation, but all nations. Look at verses 13 to 15 with me. He says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. We worship the Lord, friends, because he has complete knowledge of our lives, full awareness of our needs and our circumstances. With a penetrating gaze, God watches over every person on earth, not just those who believe in him, but over every single person, saved and sinner alike. And not just those who are alive right now, but on all people throughout all of history and on into the future. And while his dwelling place is in heaven, the Lord is not distant. He is close. It says that he sees all and he watches all. That's an idea of being close to someone. 
God's eye is on each individual, male and female, young and old, rich and poor, great and small. And we praise him for his divine care, for he has compassion on all. He created them all and he formed the hearts of all and he considers everything that is done for he is concerned about what is happening in the hearts and minds of people. Nothing escapes his perfect sight. And because the Lord, or because the Lord's watchful eye discerns everything, because he watches over us and has complete knowledge of our lives, he is able to protect us from our enemy and provide for us in any situation. Look at verses 16 to 19. It says, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope it is, or sorry, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. In these verses, the psalmist begins to use images from the battlefield. A few verses back, he was using images from creation. Now he's using images from the battlefield. And in these verses, he was referring to kings and armies and warriors and horses. This has led some scholars to suggest that maybe this psalm was written following a particular military victory, an important victory of some kind. Maybe one that was led by King David himself, since he is believed to be the author of this psalm. But I believe the psalmist is turning our attention to the battlefield simply because it is one place where human strength and strategy seem to determine the outcome. But the psalmist boldly declares, no, 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 no. Strength and strategy don't determine the outcome on the battlefield. The outcome rests in the hand of the Lord. See, no king is saved because he has a bigger army. Some of you might know Gideon learned that lesson when he defeated the Midianites with just 300 men in Judges chapter 7. The psalmist says, no warrior escapes by his great strength. David learned that lesson when he fought Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And no nation automatically wins a war just because it's got more troops or larger supply of weapons and ammunition. It doesn't work that way. Our world is governed by the Lord. He controls the destinies of nations and his word and his will and his watchful eye keep all things moving towards the fulfillment of his redemptive purposes. Now, many will choose not to believe that that's true. In fact, in another Psalm, Psalm 20, the psalmist wrote, some will trust in chariots, And some will put their trust in horses. But the author of our psalm makes it clear in verse 17 that this is a fool's hope. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its great strength, it cannot save. Horses cannot deliver and save because they do not have the power to control the movement and momentum of a battle. The God of heaven, the God of heaven is the only being in whom perfect confidence can be placed. The God of heaven is the only being in whom perfect confidence can be placed. See, only the Lord has the power to intervene and affect the outcome. Only God. In verses 18 and 19, that becomes clear. This military success is not found in larger armies or greater weapons or better strategies. It is faith in God that delivers the people of God from death and famine. Faith in God's watchful eye, knowing that he is seeing all and watching all and coordinating all things for the fulfillment of his plan. And these battlefield images were chosen by the psalmist, I believe, to remind us that safety is found in God alone. So the psalmist began by calling the people to joyful, enthusiastic, lively, and energetic praise. Sing joyfully, he said. 
Let the air be filled with music. Let your singing come from hearts that are bubbling over, bursting with joy. And then he spent the largest portion of the psalm describing three reasons why our hearts should be filled to overflowing with praise for the God of heaven. First, he said, because the word is un- his word is uncontested. It always, always, always accomplishes his de- its desired result. And second, because God's will is unstoppable. The plans of nations cannot override the plans of the Lord. They will be popped like a balloon. Only the plans of the Lord stand firm and they will endure through all generations. And third, our God is worthy of worship because God's watchful eye is unblinking. He sees all, he watches all, he coordinates all things. And his eye is on those who reverence him to deliver them and preserve their life. But now the people of Israel must choose. They face a choice to worship. And they make that choice. Look at verses 20 and 21. It says, we hope, or we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Notice the change in voice in these final verses. Suddenly it is we, us, and our This means the congregation is joining in and answering the worship leader's call. And they are responding, or they are making their choice to worship. This final section is a confession of hope in the Lord. And it's a commitment of their heart. As the people respond in faith to what they have heard and been reminded of, they joyfully dedicate themselves to waiting upon the Lord relying upon him to be their help and their shield rather than the strength of horses or the speed of chariots or the number of soldiers. They're going to wait upon the Lord and they pledge themselves to rejoice and trust in his holy name. The psalm ends with people making this petition to the Lord. Look at verse 22. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Their final request is a request for God to sustain, to to sustain his people, his faithful, waiting, trusting, and rejoicing people. Sustain them through every crisis as they put their hope in him. And that hope is well-placed. They will never be disappointed. And Psalm 33 calls each of us. There is a choice that we face about worship now. It's a call for us to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to bring before him worship that is marked by enthusiasm and celebration and spontaneity and volume. And we are reminded with these three tremendous praiseworthy qualities that our great God is worthy of our worship. And and like the people of Israel, we have to make a choice about what we're going to offer to the Lord. And we make that choice every single day. Every day when we get out of bed, we have to make that choice. But as we learn to anchor our worship in the immovable bedrock of God's unchanging character, then our spirit and attitude of thankfulness will begin to grow and increase. And as our thoughts become more focused on the Lord, they'll be less vulnerable to the shifting sands of circumstance. And we will find ourselves increasingly able to experience genuine thankfulness and joy in every circumstance. And we'll be able to reflect Christ more fully in that way. Let's pray. And then the worship team will come and lead us in our final song. Heavenly Father, you are so good, so worthy of our worship, and we give you praise and glory and honor. And God, I pray that our lives would be a reflection of your goodness and your kindness and your greatness before a watching world. And may our worship, which began here this morning, may it continue on in our hearts all through the week. 
we have much to praise you for and thank you for. We thank you for Austin and Stacy and the dedication of Sadie. We pray that you would stay near to them as parents as they seek to raise all three of their kids to know you. We ask that you would give them support and encouragement and patience and wisdom. They'll need those for each season of parenting. And I pray that you'd help us as a church to love and encourage them along the way. And God, I thank you for Psalm 33 and for the reminders in it. Reminders that you are worthy of our worship. Give us eyes to see your presence and activity in our lives this week. And may our hearts respond to you uh, with thanksgiving and joyful worship. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you so that our worship may be anchored in your character, not in our circumstances. Thanks for being so good to us as individual people and to us as a church family. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm.